You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, podcasting to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here on this 11th day of January 2013. Welcome to episode 253 of the Corbett Report podcast, The BBC Exposed. In 1922, the British Broadcasting Corporation became the world's first national broadcasting organization. In the ensuing eight decades of its existence, it has become the world's most recognizable media platform, with a reach extending to the far corners of the globe. Having attained such a position, it is not surprising that the BBC has come in for its share of criticism over the decades, but even amongst a public long used to BBC corruption, waste, and scandal, the recent controversy regarding the BBC's cover-up of the activities of former BBC presenter Sir James Wilson Vincent Jimmy Savile has managed to outrage even the broadcaster's staunchest proponents. Newsnight is also under scrutiny for failing to broadcast a report on child sex abuse allegations against the popular BBC personality Jimmy Savile, who's accused of abusing potentially hundreds of victims. On Monday, head of news Helen Bowden and her deputy Stephen Mitchell also stepped aside in wake of the scandal. The editor of the segment, Peter Rippon, said he axed the investigation because of lack of evidence. Instead, a series of tributes to Jimmy Savile were aired across the BBC's radio and TV network last year after his death. Here we go for a warm up right now, then. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Top of the Pops. He was a pop pioneer. <laughs> and how about that then? <laughs> and a multi million pound charity fundraiser. He made us belt up in the 70s. Front click every trick. Now then. And fixed it for thousands of kids' dreams to come true. For 60 years, Jimmy Savile has been part of our lives, a great British eccentric. Well, last month, nearly a year after Jimmy Savile's death, ITV released a documentary called Exposure, The Other Side of Jimmy Savile. The widening BBC scandal also has implications on the other side of the Atlantic here in the United States. Former BBC Director General Mark Thompson is the incoming New York Times company chief executive. He was at the helm of the BBC last year when the investigation into Jimmy Savile's alleged child sex abuse was dropped. Thompson claims he was unaware of the program's investigation and had no involvement in the decision to cancel the report. The fact that Jimmy Savile was not only able to operate freely within the institutional confines of the BBC for decades, but actually to flourish there, despite it being widely known in media circles that he was an active pedophile, speaks volumes, not only to the BBC's own ability to cover up, whitewash, and even act to actively enable the most atrocious crimes of its own presenters, but also speaks to the absolute rot at the core of the British political and media establishment. It must be remembered, after all, that the BBC operates under a royal charter through a board of trustees personally appointed by the Queen herself. And, after all, Her Majesty saw fit to confer knighthood upon this child abuser back in 1990. This comes as the Queen has kept silent about the recent child abuse scandal around the BBC that is described as the worst crisis to hit the corporation in 50 years. She has refused to comment on the subject despite the fact that the scandal is a moral issue of public interest and that she is directly involved in the matter. The BBC is run by 12 trustees appointed by the Queen in person, while she granted Savile knighthood in 1990. Critics argue that Savile was knighted when his abuse was well underway and the Queen should have distanced herself and the royal family from the paedophile immediately after allegations of his perverted activities to ward off unwanted speculation. I don't think anybody ever wrote down what his role was what his brief was, what he was allowed to do or not. 
He was simply seen as a friend of the establishment. However, there has been no comment by the Queen herself, her office or the royal family, as if she knew of Savile's scandalous behaviour and decided to decorate him regardless. As for the BBC, it runs under a royal charter, the present one having come into force in 2007 and running until the end of 2016. Well, the chairman of the BBC Trust, Lord Patton, used to be the governor of Hong Kong, and he said that there are more managers in the BBC than there are in the Chinese Communist Party. That's a sort of odd thing to say about your own organisation. The magnitude of the Savile scandal and the unfolding drama, including comments by Tom Watson, an MP who openly suggested in Parliament that there may be a paedophile ring going right to the British Prime Minister's office at Number 10 Downing Street, raised more questions. Sadly, there will be more to come. We, we, we know here at NAPAC that there are more names going to come out that will shock the nation and, um, and no doubt over time more names will come forward. There's no way that um, we will ever be able to imprison all the people who, are, who hurt our children because we would have to build a thousand new prisons. But I think the mere fact that we're discussing this issue now, the mere fact that the police are making statements saying that if you abuse a child, you'll be looking over the, your shoulder for the rest of your life, I find that a very positive statement. The fact that child abusers like this are hobnobbing with the political elite and being feted by royalty themselves should come as sadly as no surprise to those who have had their eyes on these elite pedophile rings for any length of time. And listeners only need to cast their mind back to episode 39 of this podcast, Who is Jeff Gannon?, where we went over in some detail that phenomenon in the American context, including activities that are alleged to go on in the Bohemian Grove and even in the White House. Some very disturbing information, but that this scandal is now enmeshing and ensnaring even that most august of institutions, the BBC, well, should come as no surprise to those who understand what the BBC is and how it has functioned as an institution over the past better part of a century as nothing other than a mouthpiece for those with political power. And I say this advisedly, and I say this on the back of a lot of evidence-based, thoughtful criticism that has been provided by some very interesting alternative media outlets. So let's turn to some of that evidence to start building today's case. And we'll start with an article from medialens.org, which posted this back in July of 2011 in the midst of the British-backed NATO-led bombing of Libya, bombing in the name of peace and freedom, that unfortunately the BBC were only too happy to provide propaganda cover and support for. And this article is entitled BBC Bombast, Propaganda, Complaints, and Black Holes of Silence. Quote, On the BBC television news, the pulsing theme tune sets the tone. The world is a serious place, and we, the BBC, are here to give it to you straight. The computer-animated intro, featuring the Earth encompassed by transmitted signals, together with a high-tech news studio, proclaims impeccable credentials. The newscaster, Hugh Edwards, Fiona Bruce, perhaps Emily Maitlis or Nick Owen, looks directly into the camera with the requisite degree of gravitas. The message is clear. You can trust us. We have no agenda. This is the BBC. This is the news. The dramatic packaging allows propaganda to slip through in digestible chunks, and it is a diet that, like the Soma in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, promotes mass adherence to state ideology. We are fed myths that our government are essentially well-intentioned, that powerful investors, banks, and corporations promote free trade and open markets while providing responsibly for society's wants and needs, that prevailing state corporate policies and practices constitute human progress, and that, in any case, no serious or credible alternatives exist. Anyone can spot the propaganda with a modicum of vigilance while watching the news. For example, take the BBC News at 10 report on June 19th about the deaths of nine Libyans, including two babies, killed in a NATO air raid. The NATO killings were presented in the headlines as what the Libyan government says happened. In his piece, Middle East editor Jeremy Bowen repeated the party line, NATO's mandate is to protect civilians. Three days later, Bowen reported the brutal consequences of yet another NATO air attack, with 15 dead, including at least three children and two women. Over footage of the bombed house, Bowen said, It, NATO, says close monitoring showed it was a command center. The family say it was their home. 
Then Bowen continued with the following astonishing remarks. Was a decision taken that killing civilians here would save others elsewhere? And, the deaths here raise the moral question at the heart of the NATO mission in Libya. Its mandate is to protect civilians. So is it ever justifiable to kill them? Imagine a BBC correspondent asking of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, was a decision taken that killing civilians here would save lives elsewhere? It simply would not happen. When Bowen was challenged by a media lens reader, the BBC editor replied, It's always worth pondering moral issues. End quote. Well, that is a disgusting example of the depths of propaganda that the BBC sink to when holding up and towing the party line when it comes to such things as the brutal bombing to smithereens of Libya in the name of protecting that population. And if all of this seems a bit bombastic itself to accuse the BBC of propaganda and even of using uh, absolute disgusting techniques to try to promote war and bloodshed, well, this is actually not so far out there for anyone who's familiar with the true institutional history of the BBC, and one of its most famous employees, Eric Blair, aka George Orwell, the author of 1984. And it is a somewhat well-known fact that Eric Blair did indeed work for the BBC during the Second World War as a propagandist, spreading propaganda to India and other parts of the globe. And although Orwell himself, Blair himself, did tend to downplay his time at the BBC in the latter years of his life, many have noted the, that there are some striking resemblances between the BBC and Big Brother in 1984, and it is perhaps for this reason that the BBC is often referred to as the B Big Brother Corporation. And uh, again, these, these similarities between Eric Blair's biography and during his time working for the BBC and the, uh, the enemy portrayed in 1984 are striking and noteworthy. So let's document some of them. This time, let's turn to a uh, book that is called George Orwell Battling Big Brother by Tanya Agathocleus. And you'll excuse me for mispronouncing that name. But in this, uh, Tanya notes... The BBC experience was later to provide Orwell with ample material for his creation of 1984's nightmarish bureaucratic world. The BBC's maze-like offices, the green felt it used on tables to reduce noise, and its basement canteen all appear as significant details in his portrait of 1984's various fiendish ministries. Miniform, the real-life abbreviation for the Ministry of Information, is echoed in the novel in the Ministry of Truth's abridge named Mini true. And just as the MOI building towered over London to such an extent that Orwell could see it from his home, the Ministry of Truth is constantly visible to 1984's central character, the doomed rebel Winston Smith. End quote. And for those who go on continuing to read through that book, you'll find that, in fact, Newspeak as well also comes from a British government uh, uh, initiative at that time to try to reduce English down to 850 essential words for pro broadcast uh, through propaganda to the far reaches of the British Empire during the war. And this was called Basic English, and it was through Orwell's struggling to try to put some of his reports into this Basic English that he derived his idea for Newspeak, another thing that has entered into our political lexicon and which we often identify as being part of Orwell's rant against communism and central command that way. But most people don't know that a lot of his material for the book did come from his own experiences as a propagandist for the BBC a fitting indictment, if ever there was one. Well, to actually go and to delineate all of the various instances of the BBC's propaganda and its alteration of history and its outright use of lies and other techniques to try to manipulate public opinion would, of course, take not only this podcast, but several hundred more. So I'm, uh, I'm afraid we'll only be able to do justice to a trifling sum of these examples today. But Nonetheless, let's roll up our, our sleeves and get to work, and we'll start with a fittingly Orwellian example, an example of, well, something that's been shoved down the memory hole, or at least that the BBC attempted to shove down the memory hole. But of course, now that we are in the internet age, it is not quite so easy to do that anymore. So let's look at this example. This comes from globalresearch.ca, which posted this up back in last September under the headline, BBC Scrubs Video of US-Backed Syria Rebels Committing War Crimes. 
Quote, The BBC and New York Times scrubbed their own video and news story showing Syrian terrorists forcing a tortured prisoner to become a suicide bomber. Government censors have apparently ordered the BBC and the New York Times to delete videos and an accompanying on-the-ground video report showing U.S.-backed terrorists in Syria committing war crimes. The move by the BBC follows a similar mo similar moves in the past, including the scrubbed BBC report that revealed the police beating a 16-year-old girl spark that sparked the London riots, and a scrubbed BBC documentary on Israel's secret nuclear weapons program, among others. The latest scrubbed BBC video shows free Syrian army rebels preparing a 300-kilogram bomb that is loaded onto the back of a truck to be detonated at a government checkpoint in the city of Aleppo. The report explains how the U.S.-backed terrorists tell the prisoner they have captured they have captured that he is being released as part of a prisoner exchange. The rebel terrorists then give him the truck and send him on his way to the government checkpoint and attempt to remotely detonate the bomb and turn the prisoner into an unwitting suicide bomber. However, the video then shows the terrorist returning, disappointed that the bomb didn't detonate, as the BBC narrator admits that forcing prisoners to become suicide bombers would certainly be considered a war crime. At their base, the group have a prisoner. They say he's a member of the Shabiha militia, which is loyal to the government, and that he's confessed to carrying out killings. He bears the bruises of a beating, it's said from those who'd held him before tonight. The rebels appear to be treating him well, offering him cigarettes and a shower, and he's told that he'll be released as part of a prisoner exchange. Blindfolded, he's driven towards the city. He's told all he'll have to do is drive the truck towards a government checkpoint. What he doesn't know is the truck is the one that's been rigged with a 300 kilo bomb. The rebel fighters intend to detonate it remotely when he approaches the checkpoint. He's being tricked into being an unwitting suicide bomber. But the fighters return disappointed. When they press the detonator, the bomb failed to explode. The New York Times journalists who filmed all of this say that at the time, they were not aware of the rebels' intentions. Using prisoners as suicide bombers would certainly be considered a war crime. And whilst those opposing President Assad have said they respect the rights of prisoners, this video shows what some rebel fighters are willing to do. Gordon Carrera, BBC News. Sadly, this is not the only example to come from Syria or even from some of the other conflicts that the British government finds itself embroiled in in recent years or even some of the conflicts that it wants to start. And we see in the BBC a ready and willing accomplice to try to kick things off in terms of hatred against uh, the Iranian regime and some sort of support for the overthrow of the current Iranian government. And we can see this from stories that not only were biased, not only were scrubbed, but were in fact actually altered to try to create a false perception of the reality on the ground in Iran. I know, I know, try to hold in your shock. But this comes, for example, by way of whatreallyhappened.com, which posted this article on media propaganda on Iran, pointing out that the LA Times, for example, had a, a picture showing hundreds of thousands in Iran protest vote result, which is illustrated by a picture of Ahmadinejad waving to a, a very, very large, vast crowd of, of cheering Iranians holding Iranian flags, which would seem to undermine the point of the article itself. But lo and behold, the BBC took a hold of that very same picture and merely cropped out Ahmadinejad, asserting that the rally was in fact not pro-Ahmadinejad, as it actually was, but was in fact pro-Musavi, was actually in favor of the so-called Green Revolution that was attempting to be fomented at that time, mostly with the help of outside forces, as I've documented in other places on the website. So the BBC out outright caught in a total fabrication attempting to claim that this pro Ahmadinejad rally was in fact a pro Musavi rally, and when they were caught with their pants down and they could not face all of the protests they were getting, they did their little mea culpa on the BBC website. So this is from the 19th of June 2009. They had this uh, letter from the editor 
The, quote, the crisis over the Iranian election has been our lead story for most of the week. As with all our coverage, we have been careful to report what both Ahmadinejad and Musavi supporters are saying. Similarly, we have taken care to label the pictures we use, explaining what they are of. However, on Wednesday the 17th of June, we made a mistake in a picture caption published on BBC News Online. In the story, Obama refuses to meddle in Iran, we mistakenly stated that a Getty agency picture of a pro Ahmadinejad rally was a pro-Musavi rally. Some blogs, including whatreallyhappened.com, are pointing out that the LA Times used a similar photograph which showed President Ahmadinejad waving to his supporters. The Getty pictures we received did not show Mr. Ahmadinejad. When a reader contacted us about it, we checked our caption and corrected it. We're sorry for the mistake and have added a note explaining the correction to the story. End quote. Well, news organizations can make mistakes too. They're just run by regular people. So perhaps this is just a question of some people cocking things up. It's no big conspiracy. It's just a question of getting things wrong. But interesting how the errors always happen in a way that supports the official government propaganda line, isn't it? And uh, we can go on and on in that regard, but not even turning to issues of geopolitical significance or the, the context of war, we can turn to many other types of issues, including, of course, the European Union and the BBC's blatant pro-EU bias. And this is not a charge that is necessary, necessarily even being labeled uh, against the BBC by its critics, but the, by the BBC itself in its own internal reports. Embarrassingly enough, for the Beeb, back in 2005, they had to admit that in fact there was a pro-EU bias in the BBC's own reporting, and they did so, ironically enough, in an article on BBC News itself. And of course, this article is still something of a whitewash, but at the very least, it does provide a little bit of insight into the BBC's pro-EU bias. So this article is entitled, BBC Must Improve EU Coverage, and it comes from the 27th of January, 2005. Quote, The BBC must make its coverage of Europe more demonstrably impartial, an independent inquiry has said. The report, commissioned by the BBC governors, found no evidence of deliberate bias in BBC reporting, but it said there was a widespread perception of certain forms of cultural and unintentional bias which had to be corrected. BBC News has set up a working group to examine the report in detail and draw up its response to the findings. The governor said in a statement, We are pleased that the panel found no evidence of deliberate bias in the BBC's coverage of EU matters. That said, we note the panel's conclusion that there is a widespread perception that the BBC suffers from certain forms of cultural and unintentional bias, and that the BBC's coverage of EU news needs to be improved and to be made more demonstrably impartial. End quote. Yes, so speaking of doublespeak, I think we can see it very much in action in this statement where, no, there is no actual bias. It's just a perception of cultural and unintentional biases that have somehow found their way into our reporting on the European Union. And uh, despite the fact that there is no bias, the BBC urgently needs to take action to correct any possible perception of bias so that they can be demonstrably more fair in their coverage. Of course, all of that is bureaucratic gobbledygook. And in the ensuing years, so I'm sure it has surprised no one to see that the BBC has continued incessantly to have blatantly pro-European Union coverage. And in fact, we have seen that time and time again, including, for example, this report, which came in the context of Ireland's second vote on the Lisbon Treaty, i.e. the EU constitution in all but name, when the Irish people were asked to vote once again because they didn't vote right the first time. And apparently those are the, 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 the supreme democratic principles that the European Union is upholding. And the BBC, in its fair and balanced reporting on the subject, managed to find, of course, not only a supporter of the EU, who re recommended that Ireland vote yes on this vote, but even in the choice of critics, the person that they has asked to appear to present the no side, he was fully willing to admit that the EU was a good thing for Ireland. The mood in Ireland has changed significantly. Since the last referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, the economic boom has ended and the country is trying to avoid going bust. Mm -hmm. 
Here in County Donegal, they've had more than their fair share of job losses and businesses going under. At this fish and chip shop, they've reduced their prices by a third to try to survive. At a time of economic crisis, the shop owner believes Ireland now needs Europe more than ever. And that's why here, there's support for the Lisbon Treaty. I could be angry and vote no, which would be just plain politics. But for the greater future of the country, I think we have no choice but to vote yes. The last time Ireland voted, this is the county where the biggest no vote occurred. County Donegal is right on the edge of Europe. Next stop, America. And the truth is, many Irish people feel a closer attachment to Boston than Brussels. 73-year-old Joey Mirren is a retired fisherman. He voted no to Lisbon last year, and no one can change his mind. I have no doubt at all whatsoever that the European Union has been very good to Ireland. I recognise that fully, but it has been a total disaster for the Irish fishing industry. And that's why the real fishermen, the fishermen who have suffered, will still be voting no come the 2nd of October. But fishermen are split on the issue, just like the rest of the country. This week's vote could have far-reaching implications, but Ireland will make its own decision based on its own needs. Everyone else can only sit back, watch and wait. Gee, I can't imagine how any anyone in the public got that strange perception that the BBC has some sort of unintentional pro-EU bias, right? Well, going from that BBC's own internal uh, report admission that the BBC does in fact have, or at least appear to have, a pro-EU bias to another admitted uh, BBC bias. Once again, the BBC does not claim to be an impartial news organization. In fact, it admits that it is partial on certain issues, such as... Well, such as the global warming debate. Back in 2006, the BBC went ahead and issued a startling editorial policy in which it states it will no longer take seriously or listen impartially to skeptics on the global warming issue. It had been convinced that the, it is in fact a settled science and that there is no debate to be had about the fact that man-made CO2 is driving the climate. How did it come to this startling decision? Well, apparently in early 2006, the top BBC editors met with a team of scientific advisors that were able to convince them that there was no debate left to be had in the global warming cons uh, consensus science. And that, uh, well, one could imagine that a team of reputable scholars and scientists would be able to convince the BBC of this. And uh, all, all one would have to do is take a look at their credentials and examine their histories and uh, examine if they have any possible biases. And once eliminating all of that, they would see that this scientific panel of experts did in fact have the credentials and the credibility to make such an assessment and that the BBC editors were right in issuing their policy. So who were these 28 advisors who were part of this meeting that convinced the BBC to become partial on the global warming issue? Good question. The BBC, for the longest time, wasn't saying. In fact, they're still not saying, but it's actually been discovered through some enterprising internet sleuths. But let's pick this story up from theregister.co.uk, which had this story on the 9th of November 2012. FOIA judges Secret 28, who made the BBC green, will not be named. Quote, As expected, the BBC has won its legal battle against blogger Tony Newbery. Newbery wanted the list of scientific experts who attended a BBC seminar at which, according to the BBC Trust, they convinced the broadcaster to abandon impartiality and take a firmly warmest position when reporting climate change. When the Beeb refused to divulge who these people were and who they worked for, Newbery took the corporation to an informal tribunal. Now the names and affiliations of the 28 people who decided the Beeb climate stance acknowledged by the corporation to include various non-scientists, such as NGO people, activists, etc., will remain a secret. End quote. Or so everyone thought at, in, there in November of 2012, but interestingly enough, uh, just days later, what happened but a new scandal broke, the 28-gate scandal. And we'll pick this one up from what's up with that.com, which had this story, the secret list of the BBC 28 is now public. Let's call it 28-gate. Quote, 
The uh, the BBC pits six lawyers against one questioning blogger, Tony Newbery of Harmless Sky, who was making an FOI request for the 28 names. In the process, the judge demonstrates he has partisan views on climate change. But now, thanks to the Wayback Machine and Maurizio Morabito, we can now read the list uh, that the BBC fought to keep secret. Damn those mischievous bloggers. This list has been obtained legally. My heartiest congratulations to Maurizio for her, his excellent sleuthing. Maurizio writes, This is for Tony, Andrew, Benny, Barry, and all of us harmless Davids. And it proceeds to give the list of people who were part of this scientific advisory panel, including such people as Robert May of Oxford University and Michael Bravo of Scott Polar Research Institute and uh, Claire Foster of the Church of England and some other interesting names. So what are we to make of this list and what does it show us about the people who were in fact coming up with this scientific advi advice for the BBC? Well, in fact, it shows that in, uh, that many of the people who were involved, uh, in fact, of all of the people who were involved, only four of them have any experience in climate science whatsoever, and that most of them are not uh, publishing active scientists who are actively researching. In fact, the majority of them are either working for pressure groups, corporations, lobby groups, or NGOs, including the New Economics Foundation, the All-Party Group on Climate Change, uh, BP International, interestingly enough, uh, Tier Fund, uh, CBI, the Open University, uh, IBT, Television for the Environment, NPower Renewables, and other such very impartial entities. Of all of those, there were only a few actual scientists who were in attendance at the meeting. So it does throw a little bit of doubt into whether or not this was a very wise decision for the BBC editors to make, not only to invite these particular people, but then to listen to their advice on the fact that this is a settled science, as if there is any such thing. But let's, let's move on, because of course it didn't just end there. The BBC has shown time and time again its bias in reporting on climate change, and it's admitted bias because it's actually <clears throat> melded right in there into its editorial policy. So we can turn to the Climate Gate affair, which whatever one thinks about that, and I'll have plenty more to say on that story, and I've of course said plenty already on this podcast, but whatever one thinks about it, it's a little known fact about the Climate Gate scandal that in fact the BBC was sitting on the climate gate documents for several weeks before they were actually leaked on the internet. So the BBC itself was covering up ClimateGate for a substantial period of time. And even then, when it actually did break, the BBC did not really start covering the story for weeks uh, afterwards. So this is all very interesting. But here we have from the Mail Online from the 28th of November 2009, quote, BBC weathermen ignored leaked climate row, row emails. The BBC has become tangled in the row over the alleged manipulation of scientific data on global warming. One of its reporters has revealed he was sent some of the leaked emails from the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia more than a month ago, but did nothing about them. Despite the explosive nature of some of the messages, which revealed apparent attempts by the CRU's head, Professor Phil Jones, to destroy global temperature data rather than give it to scientists with opposing views, Paul Hudson failed to report the story. This has led to suspicions that the scandal was ignored because it ran counter to what critics say is the BBC's unquestioning acceptance in many of its programs that man-made climate change is destroying the planet. The editorial policy influencing what news they'll report? Well, that only stands to reason, doesn't it? And yet somehow this has fallen under the radar and no one really talks about that aspect of the ClimateGate emails anymore. The BBC having actively participated in the cover-up of ClimateGate for several weeks before it was finally released online. Well, uh, let's switch to something much, much more recent. In fact, just this past week, the BBC was forced to admit a rather uncomfortable truth about the settled science of global warming, but they do their damnedest to try to cover up that uncomfortable truth under uh, a lot of verbiage. So let's take a look at this article. It's called Climate Model Forecast is Revised. It's from the 8th of January of 2013. Quote, The UK Met Office has revised one of its forecasts for how much the world may warm in the next few years. 
It says the average temperature is likely to be 0.43 degrees Celsius above the long-term average by 2017, as opposed to an earlier forecast suggesting a difference of 0.54 degrees Celsius. The explanation is that a new kind of computer model using different parameters has been used. The Met Office stresses that the work is experimental. It says it still stands by its longer-term projections that forecast significant warming over the course of this century. The forecasts are all based on a comparison with the average global temperature over the period 1971 to 2000. The earlier model had projected that the period 2012 to 2016 would be 0.54 degrees Celsius above that long-term average, within a range of uncertainty from 0.36 to 0.72 degrees Celsius. By contrast, the new model, known as HADGEM3, gives a rise about one-fifth lower than that of 0.43 degrees Celsius, within a range of 0.28 to 0.59. This would be only slightly higher than the record year of 1998, in which the Pacific Ocean's El Nino effect was thought to have added more warming. If the forecast is accurate, the result would be that the global average temperature would have remained relatively static for about two decades. An apparent standstill in global temperature is used by critics of efforts to tackle climate change as evidence that the threat has been exaggerated. Climate scientists at the Met Office and other centers are involved in intense research to try to understand what is happening over the most recent period. The most obvious explanation is natural variability, the cycles of changes in solar activity, and the movements and temperatures of the oceans. End quote. You can go on reading the article from there, but it is absolutely amazing to watch the BBC employing every rhetorical and tactical trick in the book to try to cover up the fundamental underlying fact that they are forced to re reveal several pe paragraphs into this article, namely that, yes, actually there has been no uh, global warming whatsoever in the past two decades. But don't worry, just because the Met Office is now having to revise all of its predictions that it has previously made for what we should be experiencing right now and what we will be experiencing in the next few years, that doesn't mean that their long-term projections are wrong. In fact, they are even more certain than ever that their long-term projections are right, even as their near-term projections prove startlingly wrong. Yes, no, I can't tell you what the weather is going to be like tomorrow, but I can tell you what it's going to be like a hundred years from now. Uh, these are just some of the problems with this. I'll, I'll point to some of the other problems, including the wide range of uncertainty that's given for very precise estimates of global temperature rise, and, uh, and, and of course, the fact that they resort to the argument that it is natural variability that is causing this current period of non-warming despite rising CO2 levels, when, of of course, if the temperature was rising, that's because of CO2. If the temperature is not rising, that's because of natural variability. You cannot make this stuff up, and I will interrogate this in much greater detail in a forthcoming video series I'm working on about global warming. But uh, stay tuned for that. We could go on and on and on and on about the BBC, its propaganda, and its biases, but as I say, we simply do not have enough time in the world to document all of these. So I will leave you guys out there to continue unearthing some of your favorite pieces of BBC propaganda, and by all means, send them in through the contact form of CorbettReport.com, or leave them in the comment section of this YouTube video, and I'd be happy to, to take a look at some of the things that you uncover. But suffice it to say, there is a lot more that can be said about the BBC's propaganda and many, 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 many more examples that can be given. But I trust that the main point has been made that the BBC is not an impartial institution. It does not report the news in a dry and factual manner. It is there to influence policy. It is a mouthpiece of the establishment in oh so many ways. And the question, of course, that leaves us with is... Well, what do we do about that? Well, obviously, not being a British citizen, not living in Britain myself, there's nothing that I can directly do about this. But for the people of Britain itself, well, they're in a bit of a pickle because 
unlike the free market uh, newspapers and media platforms and and uh, and businesses that are responsive to the interests of the the people who actually purchase or do not purchase their media or who watch or do not watch their media the BBC is a government enforced monopoly so there is nothing that you can do within the confines of that law to actually bring down the BBC you can't tune it out and you can't stop purchasing it because it is mandated by law television licensing fees if you have a TV in the in Britain you're going to be paying for the BBC and this is enforced by the licensing officials who come along, along around knocking on door to door trying to collect these fees much like is used in Japan here for the NHK the Japanese equivalent of the BBC so the question then is what can possibly be done about this and in fact, the answer might be somewhat easier than one would imagine. And it might only really involve the ability to carry a video camera and the willingness to get in the face of some of these licensing officials. How to deal with TV licensing goons. Rule 1. Never give them your name or any other personal details. Never let them into your home and never admit to anything. Rule 2. Provide them with an official notice that you are evoking their implied right of access to your property. Also, provide them with a schedule of your fees. Rule 3. Always make sure you film them right from the outset. This will prevent them from trying to intimidate, and it usually scares them away. You don't mind if I film me, do you? No, 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 wait a minute, you've come to my door, you've shown me TV license identification. Why does a video scare you all of a sudden? You're all the same, you know. You all right? You don't mind if I film me, do you? Can't film me. That's uh, breaching my rights, Danny. You can film me as much as you want, I've got an um, application for a warrant here. Now it's up to you whether you want to carry on with this. Like I said, I'll go to magistrate for us. That's up to you. What do you want to a do? warrant for who? For what? This address here, I'll just show you. First of all, you can get done for that. But you can film me as much as you want, because I know I'm not bothered, you know what I mean? Yeah, look. Yeah. Yeah. My obliged to look at that? You've asked a warrant for what? I'm going to show You've you. You've come to my door? Yeah. You're a stranger? I am. TV licensing. Right. Okay. Have you got identification? Showed you my ID. You can show me my ID, I've not seen your ID. Showed you an ID. For the video, for and on the record, I have not seen who you are. Okay. Unless you're prepared to identify yourself, I don't have Again, to speak I'll show to you. you. My ID. TV licensing. For the video, please. Yeah, for and on the record. In fact, warrant. Can I have your name? 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 Are you prepared to identify yourself? Are you prepared to identify yourself? Come here with empty threats, you've got nothing. You don't even know if I've got a telly. You don't even know if I'm using or liable to have to pay for a TV licence. You know nothing. You come to me door asking personal questions and you've got no right. Power to the people. Do not trust the government. No identification. Just I am TV licensed. Not prepared to put your identification on record. Not prepared to give your name. You've got no power. Might be what, sir? Yes, if you're from where, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? I'm and what here. do you want? I'm not here to argue with you. You're, you're damn right you're not. Now, can you tell us who you are and what you want? Come on, while we're under the camera, let's hear it. Do you have anything to say? Because this will be on YouTube this evening. <laughs> yes, good evening to you, sir. Follow him, follow him, follow him. <laughs> Just make sure that you put down that the implied right of access has been revoked. All right? Have a nice day. 
Well, I certainly hope we can count on our British brethren to engage in this type of boycott of a system that really is nothing more than a mouthpiece for the establishment, and I hope they will use the momentum from this latest disgusting scandal and controversy over Jimmy Savile and his reprehensible activities that were actively covered up by the BBC as, uh, as the momentum through which they can affect a more effective public protest and boycott of the BBC. Although I don't, I'm not holding my breath that this institution will disappear anytime soon. But at the very least, we can start to inform people of some of the admitted biases of this institution so that people around the world can be made aware that it is nothing other than a mouthpiece for the British establishment and, of course, the international establishment that is uh, pervading so much of the media and owns so much of the media and controls so much of what we see and hear and read about on a day-to-day basis. So undermining the BBC and its supposed credibility, if it has any left, is, I think, something that we can all be engaged in, whether we are British or not. And of course, not only in relation to the BBC, but in terms of any government-mandated monopolistic broadcasters, whether that be the CBC in Canada or the ABC in Australia or the NHK here in Japan, or even PBS. Yes, can we even raise the specter of killing Big Bird in the United States by withdrawing government subsidies? for programming. Because once again, if the people do not even have the option of withdrawing their, their, their time, their money, and their energy from a media platform in order to ensure that it does not succeed, well, what is what on earth is it uh, in the public interest to basically steal money out of people's pockets to to hand it to these institutions. It is a ridiculous system. This is the 21st century. People are starting their own online media platforms. We do not need public broadcasters like the BBC to shove government-approved propaganda down our throats anymore. But it's not all gloom, doom, and anger. In fact, sometimes the best way to deal with a problem like this is to laugh in the tyrant's face. So on that note, I'm going to leave you with a very, very well done mashup of BBC News brought to you by YouTube. So look for the links to this in the documentation section of today's episode, along with the links to all of the other documents that we looked at today. And once again, this is only a starting point for what I hope will be your further exploration of the biases and propaganda of the BBC. That's going to do it for this week. Once again, I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, thanking you for joining me and reminding you that this is listener-supported media, so if you do appreciate this work, I ask that you help support this work, either by letting other people know about it, or if you can, to support this work monetarily, either by subscribing to my weekly newsletter or purchasing one of my DVDs. It does help to keep this independent media coming to you. And I will not be coming around with any licensing fee officials collecting uh, anything from you. So on that note, let's leave it there for this week. Thank you uh, for joining me, and I'm looking forward to talking to you again next week. Okay, hello. The BBC has won a high court battle for the right to broadcast child pornography. And there could be more bad news on the way. Good evening and welcome to the BBC's news taken out of context. Our top story tonight. The battle over bonuses is far from over. Hundreds of city traders and bankers wearing balaclavas ambushed the Royal Bank of Scotland today. Business tycoons carrying sledgehammers smashed Britain's biggest bank, shoplifting their multi-million pound bonuses. Police have described the high-flying bosses as dangerous. But first, tonight, the celebrity chef Anthony Worrell Thompson has delivered a defiant speech at his local branch of Tesco. He promised to use an iron fist to deal with protests against his TV programmes. When it comes to alcohol, how much is too much? The court in Paris said it's up to Scotland to decide. They say you should have 300 units every 45 minutes and stop off for a beer on the way home. That's already a guideline in Scotland. Our correspondent, Jeremy Cook, has been focusing on the market town of Hereford. Hereford, Hereford, Hereford. Jeremy Cook, BBC News, Hereford. A reminder of tonight's main salacious gossip. There's been a shock response around the world to video footage appearing to show US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton urinating on Boris Johnson for an ITV programme. It was deplorable behaviour. 
The Labour leader Ed Miliband has told the BBC that his cocks remained untouched for thousands of years and maybe, just maybe, the longest on record for a British citizen. Thousands of women remain confused and worried. The government says it has no plans to get the economy moving again. But David Cameron said the Olympic Games and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee would provide opportunities to showcase the country struggling to pay the bills. In the meantime, there are still plenty of people who want to kill off David Cameron. But today there was a rare display of unity in the Commons as David Cameron and the Labour leader, Ed Miliband, both decided that they should be allowed to end their own lives. And Nick is in Westminster for us. What's David Cameron actually up to? The British Prime Minister is a posh English queen. He has his own dick up his arse. Nick, thanks very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.